Hello and welcome to lesson 16 for an inspector course. Our title today is The Theme of Women. So if you copy that down into your exercise book um, and then I want you to have a look at the four quotations on the screen. So we have one from Eric, one from Inspector Gould, one from Gerald, one from Mrs Burling. I'd like you to copy down those four quotations and then sum up generally what these four quotations show you about how women were treated. So you are including like basically looking at overall, these are four separate characters talking about women. From this, what conclusions can we reach about how women were treated in 1912? If you really want to stretch yourself and you're aiming for those higher grades, then you would include embedded quotations within the answer. So for instance, this idea of women being judged by their looks. I might zoom in on the fact that both Eric and Gerald have used the word pretty. That kind of thing. Um, and the extension task is to explain why Mrs. Burling is or isn't a feminist in the play. And that's kind of your opinion. So pause the video and write the answers down. Okay, so here, for instance, we're looking at Eric and Gerald. So I said that she's described as pretty. So pretty is reminding the audience that women were judged by their looks in 1912 rather than their intelligence or potentially to have a career. Um, it really did hinge on whether or not you could get yourself a husband to become a wife and mother. That was pretty much how you could determine whether or not you were successful as a woman in those times. Um, and then in terms of your gender and class roles in 1912, we have Inspector Gould, so he says, you think young women ought to be protected against unpleasant and disturbing things. And he says that to Gerald as a dig, um, because Gerald at that point in time, um, and to the Burling family, to be honest, um, is trying to get Sheila to go off stage. So we'll leave the room, I should say. Um, and Inspector Gould is kind of thinking, well, so you want to protect her against unpleasant and disturbing things, which is ironic, given that he mistreated Eva and Sheila basically so he thinks that they should be protected and yet isn't actually protecting them and lastly we have Mrs Burling's prejudice against Eva Smith and other working class girls like her so this suggestion is that because she's working class she would expect her to have no or no low morals basically so we're going to go through what life is like for upper middle class women and then look at Sheila and Mrs Burling and their role in the play. And then we will look at what life is like for working class women and how they're presented within the play. So what I suggest you do is have the subheading life for upper middle class women in 1912. And pause this and copy it down into your exercise book. It's basically stuff that we've gone over previously, but... You do kind of need to have it drilled into your brain, especially if you have a theme question about gender, um, in which case you were looking at how like, women and men are presented in that time. So we're looking at mainly at Mrs. Burning and Sheila, and these are the only women with a voice in the play, uh, which reflects the fact that women were low in society basically um however being upper or middle class gave you some more power and privilege than it would do if you were a working class woman um however even as an upper or middle class woman you'd still just be expected to be staying at home and just looking after the household um so if you were really upper class then you might have servants that you needed to manage and look after and maintain that kind of thing you might have nannies to look after your children you wouldn't actually physically be doing all of the cooking and cleaning yourself um, you would be delegating and making sure that it was kind of run properly, which left you as an upper class woman with a lot of spare time on your hands, which then explains why Mrs. Burling is involved in the charity. This idea that she wants to feel useful, like she has some sort of purpose or role within society, um, which is good. However, she then misuses it by allowing her class prejudice towards working class women to influence her decisions that she's making when she's working in the charity. Um, so if we're looking at Edna, for instance, who is quite often kind of overlooked in terms of character questions, but I'm fairly certain that they are going to run out of questions about the main character someday and may give you a question about Edna. Because um, she does have lines. 
but her lines are basically introducing people as they come on stage um, and just standing back and listening to the Burlings talk about their treatment of a woman who basically is her. Um, the only difference is that Edna is working for the Burlings within their home, within a domestic environment, rather than working in the factory. So she's listening to their comments about labour and the workforce and like girls of that class and stuff like that. But she hasn't got a voice. She isn't able to actually say, well, hang on a minute, like, calm down. So we're going to have a look at Sheila first. So we need to copy down this table and there are three quotations. And I want you to, and this is aimed in almost entirely at building your confidence that you can do this without a teacher telling you what the answers are. Uh, so these are quotations that we will have looked at previously, we will have spoken about previously, and I want you to now to fill in this table where you're looking at what we learned about Sheila, how Priestley shows us this, and why he's shown us this. Bearing in mind that what we learn about her is basically like a sentence summing up kind of what this quotation shows about her, and it should be specific to that quotation. Um, how he shows us this, you're looking at particular words within that quotation that show you that. Um, or you might look at the fact that it's a stage direction, that kind of thing. Um, and why he's shown us this, we're looking at his overall message that Priestley has for us as an audience member. Um, we're looking at the context for women and what life was like in 1912 and what Priestley might want to have kind of demonstrated about what he felt was right or wrong about how women were treated at that time. So you need to pause the video, copy down the table and complete the table. And now we're going to do the same thing for Mrs. Burling. So again, we have three quotations. You're looking at what we learn about her, how Priestley shows us this, and why he shows us this. So the three quotations, try and do this yourselves. Uh, however, if you feel like you can't do it yourself, then there's obviously a lot on the internet to help you with that. Okay. So life for working class women in 1912. So if you write the subheading, Life for Working Class Women in 1912. Um, so in terms of their role within society, working class women needed to work, basically. It wasn't like a choice. It wasn't kind of something that they would want to do. It was out of necessity. So if they didn't have enough money to support their families, then they would get a job. However, they would be very low paid positions. So they would either be in factories or domestic services, so a maid. Um, and if you think that even today there's still a gender pay gap between men and women, so I think it's for every pound that a man gets is like 70p a woman gets, that kind of thing, um, then there definitely would have been a pay gap in those times. But there weren't any laws protecting women in terms of being exploited um, because women needed the work and they needed that job. And so they were kind of dependent on it. And Burning kind of almost acknowledges this in a way that it's it's quite an arrogant thing for him to acknowledge that he kind of says, well, if they weren't happy, then they could have gone elsewhere. And Eric says, well, how, how do you know they could have gone elsewhere? Um, that there weren't actually loads and loads of jobs available, that they would need the money. And so they would often put up with really terrible working conditions just because they needed that money and that income. So in terms of how Eva is presented within the play, um, she is the most powerless character you can imagine. She doesn't have a voice. Um, she isn't on stage. We never hear from her. The only time we hear from her is when the inspector quotes from her diary. And even then we're kind of just listening to quite private thoughts that she, I'd imagine, never would have been shared publicly. And yet it is. Um, so, we're looking at um, basically a character who has been designed to represent the most vulnerable member of society that you could imagine. Um, and in the inspector's final speech, he reinforces the idea that there are millions and millions and millions of John Smiths and Eva Smiths. And normally when I'm teaching this, everyone is like, who's John Smith? Um, because... John Smiths and Eva Smiths is basically a metaphor 
um, that they represent all working class people. Um, but they're both quite common names, I think is the idea that Priestley had behind it. It isn't, we're not talking about an individual John Smith. Um, however, Priestley has created the character of Eva Smith for the audience to kind of really fully emotionally invest in because, like, she's perfect, basically. She's just nice to everyone. She just wanted a little bit more money. She's so prissy. She's so kind. She's never annoying. They're never like, God, she used to talk non-stop. I had to dump her because she wouldn't stop banging on about whatever. Um, she's idealised. She's like this like idea of perfection, basically. Um, and yet she's abused and mistreated by upper class members of the play and particularly men within the play. So you have the, the powerlessness that she has because of her class. Um, so she has to work in order to, to survive. So she's very similar to Sheila. They're both described as being pretty. Um, they're similar age groups, that kind of thing. Clearly got similar taste in men. Um, <laughs> little joke there. Um, however, Sheila's upper class. Um, and that is the big distinction and that the privilege and kind of the protection about the Ford Sheila that she's able to go into a shop and announce that because she's a burling, you need to fire that member of staff because she laughed at me. Can you honestly imagine having that kind of power? Because I'd imagine if I tried that, people would laugh in my face. Um, she likes power because of her gender. So there's this idea of her being rescued by Gerald from old Joe McGarthy. Um, but bearing in mind that that kind of being rescued is not just due to her class, it's all genders, um, all women even, because Sheila acknowledges that she has a friend who also had a narrow escape from old Joe McGarty. So to be fair to Joe McGarty, he isn't picking on her just because she's working class. He's picking on her because she's a young, defenceless woman, um, which also shows that she's powerless. Um, we also have this idea of Sheila using her power as an upper class woman to um, pick on and punish Eva because she's prettier than Sheila. So this suggests that being pretty might be a, like a marginal, teeny tiny form of power for women in 1912. Um, that women were kind of pitted against one another in terms of their looks. That basically meant that women were left feeling very insecure, that if you thought that another woman was prettier than you, that you would need to kind of take her down in some other way to stop her kind of negatively influencing your life. Um, and lastly, she lacks power because she has no friends or family. And the inspector keeps reminding us of this. Again, it is just designed to make her really sympathetic, that we feel really sorry for her. But she had no one. And she was very lonely and we we're kind of he's adding these kind of descriptions and those kinds of words whenever he talks about her to really hammer home this idea of just how isolated she was. So within your workbook, you need to look at the Understanding Eva page and there's lots of different words on there. And I want you to choose one word per section um, to describe Eva Smith and using the quotations on the screen. Just write down what your opinion is of Eva with those quotations to support. Of course, you can also find more quotations. There's tons online or in your play. Uh, you don't necessarily need to use the ones that I have chosen. So pause the video, get your workbook out, start filling it in. OK, and now we're going to have a look at the gender page in your workbook. So here we have um, an overall kind of question. So how is gender presented? Um, and normally you would kind of look at both genders. So, but we're going to be looking particularly at women today. Um, and what we need to do is kind of reflect on the ideas that we've explored about Sheila, Mrs. Burning and Eva and how they're presented and fill in the table in your workbook. There's so much online to help you and BBC Bite Size is a great place to start. Um, if you're still feeling quite confused and you're not really sure how to complete the table, then please do get into contact with your class teacher and not just kind of when they're asking to see your workbook and you notice that it's empty. Get in touch with them now um, and fill it in gradually rather than all in one go, because it will really help develop your understanding of the play. 
So our last activity um, is to consider this statement. So an inspector calls is a fundamentally sexist play. The only reason Eva Smith is a young woman is because Priestley knew the audience would care more about the welfare of a girl over a man. Um, and I would like you to write a response to say what to what extent you agree or disagree with this statement. And there isn't really a right or wrong answer to this. It's just you arguing your opinion with quotations from the play to support. Um, so you need to kind of think about how women are presented and treated in the play and whether you think that Priestley is kind of deliberately manipulating the audience into caring more about Eva Smith and caring more about working class people by presenting this young, pretty girl rather than having like a working class elderly man who's not that good looking. I don't know. Um, do you think he's doing that on purpose? And if so, does that make it a fundamentally sexist? Fundamentally means kind of like at its bare bones, basic level, an inspector calls is never going to not be sexist because of this. Um, and I'm not expecting this to be kind of the thing that you would kind of spring to a yes or no answer immediately. Let's be honest, we all have a lot of spare time on our hands. Um, think this over. Maybe get in touch with one another, get in touch with your class teacher, kind of toss around different ideas and see what conclusion you reach before answering the question with quotations.